In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. So this past week, I had an opportunity to chat with one of our members of our congregation, and we were chatting about the nature of Scripture. It was a wonderful conversation. And you know what? It's okay. You can be jealous. Because I do get to talk about the scripture pretty much every day. I'm betting that you all don't get that opportunity, do you? Sometimes at work, in your neighborhoods, in your homes. If you started a story about, if you started a conversation with a story of scripture, people would be a little standoffish, wouldn't they? The gist of our conversation this week was about the living nature of Scripture. God still speaks to us today, often using Scripture, sometimes in the voice of a trusted friend, almost always in a stunning sunrise. So you have likely heard this story from John's Gospel, the story of Lazarus or perhaps a literary or scientific reference to the Lazarus effect. That which was dead is no longer dead. There is resurrection in literature and science. We have had these same lessons appointed in our cycle of the Revised Common Lectionary, and so three years ago this week, we listened to the same story. But for thousands of years, this story has been recounted. It has been read silently or aloud, globally. But we rarely hear the same message from the scripture twice. The words and stories of the scripture are timeless. And the words of the scripture are alive for us today. So what is it that God is saying to you in these scriptures today? Some of what you hear depends on where you are, literally and figuratively. Where you are on the journey of faith, where you are on the journey of geography, where you are in your timeline of life. And some of the message relates to the messenger. This is John's gospel we're listening to. It is a retrospective theological treatise I picture a school or a team of writers around a big table with many of the scriptures and all of the sources spread out before them. This story of Lazarus may be a very vivid telling of a short story from Mark's gospel because there is great detail in this story. There is movement. There is drama. And you were all very good to stand for that nice long reading. This is a story that we have all experienced. This is a story of drama and import. Surrounding Jesus in this story, there are some really significant big characters. Lazarus, Mary and Martha, his sisters, the friends of Jesus who were traveling with him, the friends of Mary who've come out from Jerusalem. I invite you to think about the people in this story and perhaps to place yourself in this story. Imagine where you see you are. Gathered at the bedside of Lazarus, who is gravely ill, we can see that scene to be one of ancient times, in a small village in the first century, with medical treatment steeped in what we might consider alternative healing methods these days, something that was close to nature medicines made from herbs and roots. But it's not hard to see the dynamics of this story in a modern, high-tech setting, with everything from hospitals to alternative medicines to hospice care. We've all walked into an ICU unit. So gathered around Lazarus, we see Martha. Martha, Martha, Martha. She is the busy, productive sister. 
You want something done, you give it to a Martha. And we could imagine Martha in this story providing for every need of her ailing brother. Do you have a sister like that? I do. Coordinating the care, talking to the doctors, the nurses, the technicians, scheduling, explaining the care. Maybe the caregiver in your world is a brother or a spouse, a son, a daughter, a companion, a friend. Perhaps you are the Martha for someone in your life. Her sister Mary. In the seminal story of Martha and Mary, we remember Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, listening, immersed, learning, not doing anything. Mary's role at the bedside of her ailing brother is the one of the prayer. She is the prayer coordinator. She's the one sending out the emails, updating the Caring Bridge site, bidding the prayers of the community near and far. Mary quietly points out the movement of God's spirit, modeling the calm and the prayer, comforting those who have gathered. When my uncle was dying two years ago, that role was played by his eight-year-old nephew. Jude would come out and gather everyone in the family. Come on, he said, it's time to go. We're all going in now to pray for Grandpa. And he would gather his uncles and his mother and his father and his brothers all around the bed and lead them in prayer. Eight years old. Who is Mary to you? Who are you marrying? Perhaps you are the one in the family recognizing that unique combination of medicine and prayer. Now, there are plenty of friends in this extended family. The Jews, the friends of Martha and Mary and Lazarus, are all at the house. Likely, they have been bringing meals tending to the practical so that others can attend to the medical. They're watching, they're following the sisters around, trying to be as supportive as they can. The disciples, friends traveling with Jesus, and they're increasingly engaged in Jesus' work. They're far away, but they're getting the news, and they're really struggling with their response. The sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. That is the phone call that we all dread. Jesus' disciples think it is too dangerous for him to go to Bethany, to the bedside of Lazarus. On the last trip to Bethany, which is just two miles from Jerusalem, there were threats and stonings. Perhaps you recognize the struggle of family and friends. As we hear, are so many transplanted from other places. We struggle with returning home for the final days of a loved one's life. When should we go? How do we cover the base here and still have the right amount of time to spend there? Will you get there in time? What can we do to help from such a distance? Now all this is happening around Lazarus himself, the beloved brother of Martha and Mary, a good, close friend of Jesus. Lazarus is indeed at the center of this family drama, calling together the family to share in the sacred passing. For Lazarus may know that these are his last days. We don't know much about Lazarus. We don't know his age. We don't know if he had a soulmate or children. We don't know whether he had a long, full life or a life of promise ahead of him that is about to be cut short. We've all been present to those possibilities. Maybe you have been Lazarus yourself, a moment of life and death illness. The moments of death are always sacred. God triumphs in death even when this world loses. The moment of death is always sacred when one leaves this life and passes into eternal life. Sometimes we have days of preparation for that. Sometimes we have years of preparation for that. Sometimes death comes in an instant, in an accident, in an incident, in a violent 
action of this world. And it is still a sacred moment. For death of these mortal bodies that we have is inevitable. But the loss of one we love is incomprehensible. Jesus, where were you? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus feels the grief. He saw the anguish of the ones he loved. And Jesus began to weep. For he knew that God does not always get God's way in this world. When the friends saw the tears, they said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out, shedding the ties that tried to bind him. Sometimes there is resurrection in this life. An incredible new drug, a life-saving surgery. A moment of grace in a situation where we know we don't deserve the grace, and the tide turns. There is death, and there is resurrection. For as many times as resurrection happens in this life, more times, I think, death happens. And we sit in the stunned silence of grief, or we lament with righteous indignation and anger at wrongful and violent death. But the moment of death is always sacred, set apart for the miraculous, for the person we love and have lost is now in the presence of God. We pray, give us grace to see in death the gateway to eternal life. This Lazarus story is a story of two certainties, death and resurrection. Death, always sacred. Resurrection in many different forms. Now in this world and in the world to come. So where are you in this story? What did you hear? What is your message from this gospel today? Sometime during this week, I invite you to reread this story from your unique vantage point. You know, the Revised Common Lectionary designers have placed this John Gospel here two weeks before Easter as we are about to begin the dramatic movement toward Jesus' resurrection. The scriptures and messages of these next two weeks are leading us through the cross to resurrection. As we travel this path together, I encourage you to attend as much as you can. Next Sunday will be Palm Sunday, then Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, our great vigil of Easter, and our magnificent Easter Sunday morning services. And maybe in this two-week time, take the opportunity to talk about the scripture. Talk about it in your workplaces, in your neighborhoods, in your homes. Talk about and read the scripture again and tell your own story, your own story of sacred, revealing resurrection. For God still speaks to us today. The words and the stories of the scripture are timeless. And the words of the scripture are alive for us today. So what is it? What is God saying to you? Amen.